Hello and welcome to this short video on modelling credit risk. Now it is going to be quite a short video because the main purpose is going to be to say what I'm going to be doing in other videos as well as just giving an overview about what modelling credit risk uh, actually means. So if you think of this as more of a heads up and um, a menu of the various types of credit risk that I'm going to be covering over the next few weeks, months, years, then hopefully it'll serve some sort of useful purpose. So what I'm going to do today is talk a little bit about the purpose of this series of videos that I'll be doing. And it's really to look at some of the techniques which are used to measure credit risk and, and credit risk specifically. And this means it's important to define exactly what I mean when I'm talking about credit risk here. Because um, credit risk can have a range of different definitions depending on uh, the context, depending on who's using it. In the broadest definition of credit risk, you're talking about um, defaults, but also downgrades, uh, the impact of the widening of credit spreads on the value of a security. And this has a big overlap with various other types of market risk, so very, various other types of risk in relation to investments, whether it's equities or interest rates or government bonds or currencies or something else. Because you can model all of those using the same kind of techniques that you use to model um, the change in the value of a bond because the spread has widened. Now, whilst that's interesting and useful, it's part of a broader area of modelling market and investment risk. So it's not really what I'm trying to do here. What I'm looking at is a, a narrower definition where I'm focused only on default risk. So I'm limiting uh, the view of credit risk to the risk of loss from non-payment. So that implies that things like spread risk are going to be covered under market risk and that's another series of videos. Um, so this is looking purely at what we're going to call credit risk models. So when we're looking back at credit risk for financial institutions, there's a range of institutions affected by credit risk to, to varying degrees. And the main ones that I, I think we'd want to consider are going to be banks, because for banks, credit is often the largest risk in the form of the various loans that they make, but also in the form of various credit-based structured products, things like collateralised debt obligations, where they package up a range of loans or um, other obligations into portfolios and make payments based on those. There were big news just before the financial crisis and then they caused the financial crisis so it became slightly um, less popular after that. But um, they're, they're still out there, they're still used and, and looking at portfolios of credits is, is still a very important um, area for, for banks. And, and also banks are subject to derivative counterparty risk. So if you've, if you've got derivative transactions, you only get paid if your counterparty is still solvent. So assessing the, the risk, the credit risk in those counterparties is, is important. When you look at insurance companies, you've got uh, the risk of reinsurer failure. When you're looking at pension funds, you've got the risk of sponsor insolvency. These things can uh, be modelled using various types of, of credit models. Some models will be more useful than others when we're looking at this particular type of risk. And also bank creditors and insurance policy holders, um, they face credit risk as well. Um, the, the, the risk that the, the bank or the insurance company that they've got their relationship with is not going to be there to pay up when, when they need it to pay up. And bondholders, of course, of financial and other institutions are going to be subject to credit risk. Now, what I've got here is um, a partial map of credit risk modelling approaches. So, I mean, this is what I'm going to be looking at, basically. And it might change, and because of when I'm doing the videos, I might find some other uh, useful and interesting approaches that I want to talk about. But as you can see, it's already a fairly large list of different approaches. And, you know, being an actuary, I've tried to classify things. And um, there are two different broad groups that we can look at when we're looking at credit risk. So, and these are counterparty risk, which is basically 
looking at a single entity and portfolio risk where we're looking at the impact of bunching a whole of these things together. Then beneath these we've got qualitative and quantitative models um, on the counterparty side, um, a range of approaches directly under the portfolio side and under quantitative models um, again four different groupings parametric, non-parametric, structural and credit migration and then uh, a range of the actual approaches beneath these. So the types of credit risk considered, as I mentioned, it's counterparty risk and credit portfolio risk. So counterparty risk, this is if you're looking at um, a particular loan or derivative contract or sponsor insolvency, it's the credit worthiness of the individual organisation or individual organisation in question that we're, we're interested in. So you take a particular um, counterparty and you say what are the chances that uh, it's going to default on its obligation. Credit portfolio risk, on the other hand, is looking at a portfolio of loans and trying to work out um, how many of those will default. Um, and when we're looking at this, we're as interested in the interaction between these different credit exposures as the individual risks. So the correlation or even the shape of the correlation. So you know, it takes us back towards things like copulas in trying to work out how a portfolio of these risks might, might behave. Now when we're looking at counterparty risk, you can analyse this either qualitatively or quantitatively. And the qualitative models, I mean, these are the ones which are mainly used by credit rating agencies when they're trying to assess the risk of a particular institution defaulting on its bond obligations. And the way most credit rating agencies work is they treat this as um, an enterprise risk management framework. So they look at the enterprise as a whole and try to uh, work out um, what level of risk it presents of not uh, paying up on, on the bonds that it's issued. Now these are interesting and useful but they're so proprietary it's not really going to be that useful to learn about it as a way of um, implementing a risk management approach like that for yourself. What's more useful, I think, is the range of quantitative models that are available. And there are four different groupings that I, I think you could have here. The first is parametric. And what a parametric model does is it uses parameters applied to particular measures of um, credit worthiness and you, you apply those parameters to these measures and it gives you a number which is often going to be you know how likely is this counterparty is this institution to default so you take your whole of measures you work out what the parameters applicable to these measures are and you come up with a score now this is in contrast with non-parametric measures and in non-parametric measures what you're really trying to do is classify the results. So what you're really trying to achieve here is to take a new um, counterparty and say, okay, given the information that we've got, do we classify this as something which is likely to default or likely to remain solvent? So you're not coming up with a score, it's just a yes-no answer that you're coming up with. You've then got structural models. Now structural models are typically based on some underlying characteristic which is then used to drive um, an answer as to whether you think um, this, mod, this particular counterparty will default or not. And, and the, the most well-known of these is the, is the Merton model, which looks at the value of the underlying institution, um, how this value is likely to change over time, and how it's likely to compare with the indebtedness of the institution. And then finally you've got credit migration models. Now these use the outputs from rating agencies in terms of how likely um, companies have been historically to move from one rating to another and perhaps ultimately to, to default. Um, so it doesn't involve understanding how the ratings are arrived at, it just uses the ratings themselves as the input into these models. Now, if you compare this with credit portfolio risk, credit portfolio risk can only really be analysed quantitatively. There's, there's no qualitative credit portfolio risk models because what you're really interested in here is the relationship between the credits. That's 
that's one of the key parts of, of this type of analysis. Um, so in terms of quantitative models, they're often multivariate versions of um, the counterparty risk model. So multivariate structural models, for example, a multivariate Merton model might be one approach. Multivariate credit migration model, so looking at how a group of credits might um, change their ratings over time. You've also got uh, models called common shock models, which look at um, the extent to which common risk factors will affect a particular group of um, credits. And you've got time to default models. Now, these are the ones which were specifically developed to um, look at the risk on uh, portfolios of loans, CDOs and so on. And they use our old friends, the copulas, to, to, to work out how likely um, we are to lose a particular number of credits from, from a portfolio. So that's um, a rough roadmap of what I'm going to be doing over the next um, few videos. Um, I'll be starting off with generalized linear models, um, which you know I've already started doing a slide on those. I just need to uh, sit down and um, actually record the videos. And, and one other thing to note is I've been careful to always show how you can do this in practice. So. I've always got um, XM models um, and or models in R which show you exactly how to do this type of analysis with um, a set of data. So I'll be going through not just the theory behind these but actually running through some examples in Excel and R which hopefully will show you that it's relatively straightforward to, to implement a number of these models and, and also just talk about some of the pros and cons of the different approaches. So I, I hope you'll find all this useful and I uh, look forward to talking to you about it again soon.